arraignment of former President Donald Trump, who entered court today. You can see that there as he walked in, and he took his seat to make his first appearance as a defendant in a criminal case. This is what that moment looked like. This is here, the photo right before the arraignment officially began, and the news photographers then left the room. A standard practice that Trump's lawyers asked to maintain today. Meaning, these are the photos that Donald Trump did not want the world to see. Trump appeared at times somewhat sullen, flanked by his expanded legal team. He went on to plead not guilty today. He was watched over, as you can see here, by court officers who are there not to protect him, as he is accustomed to as a former president in so many other scenarios, but to keep order over the proceeding and potentially him or anyone else. This is what the rule of law looks like in America. I'm leaving these photos up for you as we begin our coverage tonight so you can take it in because there are so many people, including the defendant, who tried to prevent this day from ever occurring, regardless of what comes after. This was something they didn't want to happen in America. But this is America, and no person is supposed to be immune from this process if the evidence supports charges, and then you get your days in court. Defendants are afforded their rights. But this is a moment Donald Trump has both dared to happen in his way, he's courted it in a way, he's dreaded the prospect, and it played out today across the nation. Here's Donald Trump walking through the hallway. Let's listen to see if he President speaks to reporters. Will you come speak to us, President Trump? In his own voice, pleaded not guilty. This is the indictment, so we now have it. Everything we've been talking about, if you're sitting here looking at this, this is going to trial. Now we have the unsealed indictment for the first time. The DA charging Trump on fraud, lies, and election crimes, and a plot stretching from Trump's convicted lawyer, turned whistleblower, to the cooperating media company, the DA today, Alvin Bragg, made his first public remarks about the charges against Trump. These are felony crimes in New York State, no matter who you are. The defendant held documents in his hand. We cannot and will not normalize serious criminal conduct. For nine straight months, the defendant repeatedly made false statements. He was paying Michael Cohen for legal services. He also caused others to make false statements. We have a history in the Manhattan DA's office of vigorously enforcing white collar crime. That is the prosecutor's view. Later, we have a detailed and frankly, legally holistic breakdown of the whole case and the counts and what it means to see these alleged crimes laid out against Donald Trump, who has so brazenly and at times proudly defied rules, laws and legal requirements for the better part of his public life. And that's not all because he's not the first, and perhaps won't be the last, government official, government veteran, former public official, to get caught up in indictable activity. And as I said, he'll get his day in court. But there is something quite different about him from almost everyone else over the years in both parties who's faced these kind of charges. He has been proud of it. He talks like a mob boss. He talked about rats while he was in office running law enforcement for this country. He obviously and quite blatantly proudly talked about obstructing probes when he instructed all of his aides to defy lawful probes and subpoenas. This is his thing. This is part of who he is. And if you've been paying attention to America, you may have noticed a lot of people, including some of the folks who bludgeoned and attacked and tried to kill officers in the Capitol on January 6th. He's got a lot of other people on board with it. And so now today, something changes. He's legally presumed innocent, and he will be subjected to a type of rule of law and a set of protections that we know from his public comments he would not provide for others. Now, crossing the line, we have the actual transcripts from this court proceeding today. So we're going to get into that as part of our coverage. You may recall that we don't have video cameras or live feeds of the New York court system, so while our reporters... Uh, read out some of the most important highlights we now are going through and our team of, of producers and journalists here are going through this and we're going to continue to cover that throughout the hour as well as in our special coverage later tonight on msnbc i also told you that for the first time in the hour we started with our prosecutors but we're going to get into this breakdown so let me do that for you right now of the new material in the unsealed indictment this is the first criminal prosecution of former 
President Trump. He was in court today for that arraignment, as I told you, sitting with his lawyers. He spoke to the judge to plead not guilty, and he faces the system for the first time as a criminal defendant. As we mentioned, these images from court are pretty striking. They were snapped by news photographers before the proceeding began. That's then when, during the proceeding, for the same reason we got the transcript, photography video is banned standard practice. So there have been many headlines today already, and frankly, a lot of talk leading up to the unsealing of today's indictment that refer to the formal fraud counts. And now we have it, falsifying business records. And they're counted up basically as a count for every payment or transaction related to that alleged fraud. So that's the relevant law. But the prosecutors have actually charged more than a typical business record case. I want to get into that in our breakdown. One of our former federal prosecutors mentioned this at the top of the program, and it's really important tonight, and it's new. I know we all have been bracing for this, and we've read about what we expected, but we actually have the material tonight. The DA does bring business cases all the time, and it's a fraud case, and we know that. But this is about an election. And until today, no one knew how broad this prosecution would be or what the DA had fully uncovered. So let's be clear, now that the clues and the predictions and the expectations are giving way to hard facts and written charges, here's what we know. This is about an election plot. The fraud charges start as misdemeanors. The DA, though, is telling the court that they actually busted up a wider criminal election plot. In fact, it's right there on the first page of the indictment's facts section, which alleges Trump and others violated election laws. That's an allegation of election crimes, meaning of Donald Trump's many known efforts to cheat and steal elections, from the Ukraine plot that got him impeached, to the 2020 plot still under investigation in D.C. and Georgia, to those other efforts also in 2016. Of all of them, here we are. It's the oldest one, the one with a conviction on record for Michael Cohen that's led to Trump for the first time ever being indicted himself. Now, if you think about what I just said, I'm quoting and reporting on what's in these charges. When you see it laid out the way the DA does, it has a logic. It makes sense. Prosecutors allege Trump orchestrated this scheme with others to influence the 2016 election by identifying and purchasing negative information about him to basically suppress it and benefit, try to help Trump win. That's how it begins. And it ends with a reference to the convicted federal crime. The indictment argues this was unlawful, pointing out three instances where this occurred in the statement of facts. And the case boils down to a sordid plot to suppress the stories that Trump believed could sink his campaign for good, especially after the Access Hollywood tape had rocked everything. So the DA has evidence that Trump was plotting to hide two sets of stories from two women which could have impacted voters. This is the catch and kill plot along with deals to misuse an outside corporation, a tabloid company, to bury other stories and allegations, and also, by the way, it says in here today, to tar Trump's opponents. You could think of this as a kind of secret campaign donation or adjunct campaign operation. This is the charge. The whole thing sounds a bit like a movie, like sex, lies, and videotapes, except the Access Hollywood tape was real, as are the other tapes the DA has that show Trump was in on the plot. Here he was, in audio tape, linking himself, Donald Trump, to David Pecker. I need to open up a company for the transfer of all of that info regarding our friend David. I spoke to Alan about it when it comes time for the financing, which will be... Listen, what financing? We'll have to pay you. So. Don't pay for kids. No, 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 no. There's also evidence of payments to suppress his story about an alleged Trump Tower doorman who was trying to sell a story. All of this is about lies and the misuse of money and help from a corporation to influence the election and, according to the DA, to mislead voters. And the goal was Trump basically directed to delay the payment until after the election because then, when people know about his deadbeat tactics, he would avoid paying altogether. Michael Cohen then, according to this, says he instructed the tabloid CEO not to release this doorman from an agreement until after the election. This is all new in the filing. And this would be covered up as the Trump Organization maintained a digital entry for these expenses, which became part of the Trump Organization's general ledgers. Now, let me walk you through this briefly. First of all, 
The allegation's not that Trump is a deadbeat, like he owes money and that's the problem. The legal problem is it goes to his mental state, his criminal intent, allegedly, that this was all for the election. That's why he basically said, if I can duck paying it after the election, I don't even care, meaning it's only for the election, which is what Bragg says supports the idea that election laws were broken. As for the Trump organization, well, they're in here being accused of keeping false books and ledgers. That's pursuant to this new charge. But I'm going to show you something really important that may have seemed... So small, it didn't get a ton of coverage at the time. Everyone's fatigued with Trump stories. But it was in December that the Trump organization was convicted of tax fraud because of off-the-books perks and other charges. And this goes to something you may have heard a lot lately and one of our guests mentioned tonight. That case and Alan Weisselberg, they were convicted of, I bet you could guess, the same type of business fraud, because this stuff is charged a lot. So that was Weisselberg. He pleaded guilty. He's at Rikers. And that's a long list that he joins of Trump figures who ended up convicted, including, of course, Michael Cohen, who became the whistleblower here. He's one of four lawyers who's referenced in this filing. He is lawyer A. Then there's another one who was connected to one of the women. His name's Keith Davidson. He is defined here, this is pretty standard, as, quote, Lawyer B. And when we were pulling on the threads of all this, we always go to everyone to try to learn. Back in 2019, I interviewed him. When you were involved in that, did it seem like they were paying Karen McDougal, your former client, to help Donald Trump bury the story? Well, I'm not so sure if it was... uh... If I was aware of it at the time that, that uh, it was their intent to bury the story, but I think that they had clearly announced uh, their editorial preferential candidate. Not a full answer. We'd love to get him under oath, but that preferential candidate is relevant all these years later to what Trump was indicted on today. Because in the same DA statement of facts, they say these participants violated election laws and mischaracterized for tax purposes the payments. Now, In writing today, and this matters because it goes to how the case is being prosecuted, they didn't specify, they didn't list which exact law. DA referring to more than one law. He also had this chart, which is a kind of a flow chart, which shows the hush money payments going to the fraud, the false business records, the misdemeanor, and then combined with another crime, it becomes a felony. As I said, we've all been kind of getting a refresher on New York Law School here. But if there is a tax case... The DA's office, as of tonight, in this filing, has not exactly laid it out or specified it. For example, is it a New York tax case? Is it a reference to a federal tax case? Trump has had many problems with the IRS, but he hasn't been federally charged for federal tax crimes. Now, note it says plural election laws. But in fairness to any defendant, and I would say this in covering any case, you don't just get to go out list some damning facts, and say that someone violated laws. Or, it looks like a misdemeanor, but hey, we've got a list of laws over here, we haven't announced them yet, and so you're now a felony defendant. They are, sooner or later, going to have to enumerate it. Now, you may remember Mark Pomerantz. He said over and over that they viewed, some people viewed this inside the DA's office as a, quote, zombie case, because it would go away and come back over the years. We had him on this program, indeed. He said it basically as a kind of a complaint, and many people in and around the DA's office have been concerned about the way that he has described things. He's not the only authority on this, indeed. He doesn't even work there anymore. Now, this case, according to DA Bragg, has been developed more recently. Meanwhile, outside the court today, I mentioned this, and we always need to cover the whole thing so you can make up your own mind and hear all the evidence. Here's some of what Trump's lawyers were saying today. There must be something besides what we've been talking about for the past um, four or five years. There wasn't. There's nothing. The indictment itself is is boilerplate. It doesn't allege um, any federal crime, any state crime that's been violated. It doesn't allege what the false statement is. Um, And it's really disappointing. I'm going to do this as carefully as I can. Fact check number one, true. The written indictment does not specify what the enhancing crime is, which is why we quoted the current DA, Bragg, explaining verbally what he says it is, and they can pursue this case as they see fit. That's one. Uh, Fact check two, 
false if you think these sordid and often disturbing allegations enumerated in this statement of facts are boilerplate, and I don't know what kind of boiler or what kind of plate or what kind of life you're leading, um, but again, they're just asserting things, and that's part of their job to zealously defend their client, and it's our job to tell you when the legal point might be a nuance that is true, and when the rest of it is completely bananas. Now, you may recall that one of our esteemed legal experts, who is a big part of our coverage day, beat, and later tonight, Andrew Weissman, uh, referenced, and several people have, what the interplay is between the local and the feds. I mentioned law school because we have this federalism system and we have different jurisdictions. We all are kind of somewhat familiar with that, even if you're not involved in the law. And yet here you have something really unusual. Unusual doesn't mean it won't stick at trial. It just means it doesn't happen all the time. Of course, how many things about Donald Trump are unusual? Well, here you have the fact pattern of the DA today, Alvin Bragg, saying, hey, we've got the other laws. Some of them might be federal. He mentioned the federal election law, and we're going to go forward on that. Then you have the history of his predecessor, the former DA, Cy Vance, recently discussing that it was the feds who asked him to stand down. Everyone knows, whatever you think of Mr. Cohen, the main crimes, the election crimes, the payments, the beneficiary thereof were all for Donald Trump individual one. And what Cy Vance is saying there diplomatically is they made it sound like they were going to go finish the job and they didn't. We're covering today's arraignment of Donald Trump. No cameras, no live video in the courtroom. You may have heard about that, but we just got tonight the official court transcript of the proceedings and it shows Several things that we, of course, knew about from our reporters, but now we have it in full, voluminous, quoted detail. And I want to turn to something that we've only touched on briefly tonight, but is important and must be dealt with. The way that Donald Trump has been using threatening messages to try to abuse the justice system in this case. It's not a new tactic, but here's what prosecutors said today. Quote, Defendant, that's Trump, has directed a series of threatening statements to the DA's office, including posting a picture that depicts Mr. Trump wielding a baseball bat at the head of the district attorney. They went on today to say, quote, we have significant concern about the potential danger this kind of rhetoric poses to our city, to potential jurors and witnesses and to the judicial process. I want to be clear here. The warning is that former President Trump is showing thuggish and potentially criminal efforts to abuse or corrupt the justice system, an effort to use the threat of violence to avoid his own accountability. I could tell you recently, one of Donald Trump's lawyers, who was not in court today, but who has spoken on his behalf, put out this idea, and this is not a joke. They said that Donald Trump getting arrested makes him similar to some rappers like the late notorious B.I.G. Well, let me be clear about that. Today was Donald Trump's arraignment in New York, and prosecutors are literally telling the judge facts that do draw a negative comparison to something that that artist, Biggie, talked about in his fictional stories. It's a bad comparison. The Brooklyn artist famously said, at my arraignment, note to the plaintiff, your daughter's tied up in a Brooklyn basement, not guilty. That's how I stay filthy. But that was a story, like a mafia movie. The implication there was that threatening innocent people would keep a thug in the story or poem out of court. Now, that is an old song with artistic license. The problem for Donald Trump that maybe his lawyers don't fully realize is that today, prosecutors are saying as a fact, he's actually literally endangering people with his thug threats. And that could make for new charges if he crosses the line. And that's not a comparison most defendants would welcome awaiting criminal trial. 